Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 15 of LTech 676. Quiet. Before we continue with our final theme on gender and digital equity, I want to let you know that this week we'll have our second optional synchronous session. Thank you for filling out the Doodle poll. And as expected, there isn't a time that works for everyone in the class. However, there was one date and time that seems to work for 10 of you. So that's about 80%, which is pretty good. As you can see here, that date and time is Thursday, April 27th from 4 to 5 p.m. Hawaiian. Again, this session is 100% optional, so no big deal if you can't make it. But please join us if your schedule allows it. We'll meet in my Zoom room and just hang out to discuss the ideas in the course. I'll also answer any questions you might have about the final paper. Speaking of the final paper, that assignment is due by 11.55 a.m. on Monday, May 8th, so roughly two weeks from today. Everything you need to know about that assignment is in Canvas, including a sample outline and a grading rubric. But if you have any questions, feel free to bring those to the synchronous session or simply shoot me an email. Next up, I want to highlight a few interesting headlines I've collected over the years. For example, this headline reads, Can we make our robots less biased than we are? This was in the New York Times in November 2020, and it talks about how developers of artificial intelligence are trying to end the injustices of how technology is often made and used. It is definitely relevant to the social and ethical issues we've been talking about, so it's worth checking out. Here's another article sent to me by a student from a few years ago. The article is titled, Microsoft Patents Tech to Score Meetings Using Body Language, Facial Expressions, and Other Data. Talk about a Faustian bargain. This one is a real doozy. Microsoft even has an explainer video about what they're calling a productivity score. Think about the equity issues that something like a productivity score might raise. And finally, here's another favorite from the Wall Street Journal. Bots grade your kids' schoolwork, and they're often wrong. Obviously, a super interesting and relevant article exploring the intersection of technology and education. Okay, enough about headlines. I've added links to these as optional readings in Canvas. Check them out if you're interested. So let's continue with our exploration of gender and digital equity. And we'll be doing that by talking about how gender intersects with education, technology, and leadership. So let's get started. Last week, we talked about how females have endured differing educational expectations and opportunities compared to their male counterparts. Today, I want to talk a little bit about women in higher education. Now, many of you know, I suspect, that women surpass men by record numbers in college enrollment and completion. In addition, they also have a more positive view than men about the value of higher education. Here's some data from the Pew Research Center showing the growth in female enrollment and how over time, dating back to about 1965 up to about 2009, and you can see here it was about 1989 when the female enrollment began to outpace male enrollment. And another data point here is that completion rates for young female college students outpaces the completion rates of young male college students. And you can see that tipping point happened about 1992, 1993, and now it's significantly different. So that was a little bit about women in higher education. Let's talk a little bit more about women in the labor force. Well, as you probably know, women have strengthened their position in the labor force and boosted their economic standing by making gains in labor force participation, wages, and access to more lucrative occupations. However, progress on some fronts has stagnated and large gender gaps persist in leadership in government and business. So here's more data from the Pew Research Center. And here you can see that women make up nearly half of the labor force. And really that started coming together in the 1990s. We can also see that the labor rate participation rate has risen for women, although it's not as high as men. Thirdly, we could see that the gender pay gap has narrowed, 
even though it still exists. And lastly, women are now significantly more likely to be college educated than men. So that's an interesting data point in relation to the slightly lower participation in the labor force and the pay gap that still exists. Now let's talk a little bit about women in leadership. And I'm sure all of you in this class know that women still make up only a small share of the top leadership jobs in business and in politics. So in terms of Fortune 500 CEOs, as of 2018, women made up less than 5% of CEOs in Fortune 500 companies. And when it comes to being university presidents, as of 2016, that was the latest data available at the time of this report, women only made up about 30% of university presidents. Now, interestingly, Pew Research has done some analysis of the structural barriers and uneven expectations that may hold women back from high political office. Take a look at this graphic. Here we're seeing the percent of Americans saying that each of the following is either a major reason, a minor reason, or not a reason why there are fewer women than men in high political offices. And you can see they have them rank ordered here. The top one is women have to do more to prove themselves. 61% of respondents felt that is a major reason. The second reason, women get less support from party leaders. The third reason, women in politics face gender discrimination. Fourth, many Americans aren't ready to elect a woman to higher office. And I won't read them all, but let's just look at this last one. Women aren't encouraged to be leaders from an early age. Now, interestingly, on the right, we see a graphic showing the percent of men and women saying each is a major reason why there are fewer women than men in high political offices. So let's take the top item. Women have to do more to prove themselves than men. Only 48% of men felt that way, whereas 72% of women felt that way. We see a similar pattern with the second item, women get less support from party leaders. And let's jump down to the third from the bottom, which says women are held to higher standards than men. 27% of men said that was a major reason, whereas 46% of women felt that that was a major reason why there are fewer women than men in political offices. Now, Pew has collected similar information as it relates to leadership positions in business. And I won't read through this, but you can take a look at it. Again, on the left, what percent say it's a major reason, a minor reason, or not a reason? And then on the right, the percent of men and women saying that each is a major reason why there aren't more women in top executive business positions. Now, let's talk a little bit about women in the tech sector. I don't think it surprises anyone, but only 23% of tech employees are women. And that's actually a decline compared to 1995, when 37% of tech employees were women. And of major concern is the fact that only 19% of students who receive a degree in computing are women, and only 2% are actually women of color. So there's real concern about female participation in technology-related sectors. And here is some data related to women working at major technology companies. The reality is that the share of women in technology jobs has grown, but it is still low. And here we see four major technology companies comparing 2014 to 2019 data. The highest levels of female participation only represent 23% of the total employee base at these major companies. Now, I want to rewind all the way back to session seven when we were talking about the analysis of inputs, processes, and outcomes. And in particular, Sutton's focus in 1991 on the race, class, and gender differences in computer competence. And of course, let me just highlight two of those points here. In 1991, Sutton reported that gender differences were found in computer competence in 7th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade students as it relates to computer literacy. And importantly, boys outperformed girls in programming commands, program composition skills, and debugging. 
So the question, of course, is where are we today? Well, the organization, Girls Who Code, have given us some related information. And they found that nationally, participation by girls in computer science courses in grades K through 12 only averaged 37.5% of all students. So well under the halfway point that we would expect in the year 2017, 2018. And importantly, girls in historically underrepresented groups, their participation rate is even lower and just below 16% of all students. Now, here's another set of data that relates to why women drop out of computer science. So this has to do with once they actually enroll in higher education in computer science, they typically have to take a series of courses, Computer Science 101, Computer Science 201, and Computer Science 230. I think this is from Duke University. Look at CS 101. Here we see that the split between male and female students is almost even, just about 50-50. However, by the time that class is over and students enroll in CS 201, the number of female students drops to about 36%. And when that course is finished and they get to Computer Science 230, that number drops even further to under 30%. And so this is a really interesting look indicating that something is happening in those computer science courses that is pushing female students out of that major. Now let's put that in the context of what majors females have been majoring in over the past 40 years. So here's some data from the NPR show Planet Money. This was reported in 2014. And as you can see here, from the 1970s up to 2010, pretty much a steady increase in female participation in medical school, law school, and the physical sciences. However, when we plot computer science as a major, we see that there was a steady rise in the late 70s up till about 1984 or so. But since that time, there has been a steady decline or a decrease in the number of females majoring in computer science. And this is, of course, a major concern given all that we know about the nature of technology and the various biases inherent in technology. So you might be asking yourself, well, why are we seeing this decline in computer science? We don't have a lot of time to go into this, but I did want to share some resources with you in case you're interested in learning more about this. Research has looked at beliefs about intelligence and how that influences females' interest in different topics. Other research has looked at stereotypes related to computer science. Other areas of interest include self-assessment, as well as the college student experience, and the skills or lack of skills that university and college faculty bring to the computer science classroom. And other research, of course, has looked at implicit and workplace biases. So if you're interested in learning more about any of those areas as it relates to women in computer science, be sure to check out these optional reading resources available in Canvas. Finally, I want to end by talking about strategies for attracting girls to computer science. The Girls Who Code organization has put forth four policy recommendations that lawmakers should implement in order to increase computer science participation by girls and women. The first recommendation is to track and report data on computer science participation. They argue that data is needed in order to have a clear understanding of the extent of the gender gap in technology in order to devise targeted solutions. Their second recommendation is to increase exposure to women and other underrepresented minorities in technology. In other words, you cannot be what you cannot see. And in order to drive and maintain girls' interest in computer science, we must provide them with female role models. Thirdly, they recommend that we fund gender inclusion training with professional developments. We must equip teachers with the tools they need to understand and correct for how gender biases impact learning. And their fourth recommendation is to expand computer science courses to all middle schools, not just high schools. 
and they argue that nearly 70% of the growth in the computing pipeline would come from changing the path of the youngest girls, especially those in middle school. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.